Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our next fireside chat. This session features Melody Barnes of the University of Virginia, who will be in conversation with Rebecca Marmont of Unilever. Melody Barnes is Executive Director of the University of Virginia's Karsh Institute of Democracy and Co-Director for Policy and Public Affairs for the Democracy Initiative at the University of Virginia. Melody was Assistant to President Barack Obama and Director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, Executive Vice President for Policy at the Center for American Progress, and Chief Counsel to the late Senator Edward M. Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Rebecca Marmont is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever. She's responsible for Unilever's sustainability strategy and implementation globally. This includes embedding sustainability across the functions and divisions, as well as heading external engagement, advocacy, and partnerships across Unilever's priority areas on climate and environment, health and well being, and the social agenda. We'll have an audience QA portion for this discussion, so please submit your questions using the QA function. Melody, over to you. We're looking forward to your conversation with Rebecca. Great, thank you so, so much for that wonderful welcome. And it's fantastic to be here with all of you, and in particular, to be engaged in conversation with Rebecca this morning. And I'm looking forward to all the things that we'll be able to discuss about a really important issue. I think as we know, across the country and around the world, urgent questions are being asked about the relationship between the private sector and our country's biggest challenges. We also know that as our societies become less inclusive, that these are conversations that are not only taking place at kitchen tables, but they're also rippling across our communities, across the country and around the globe. That people are deeply concerned as they see this lack of inclusivity having a deep effect on the fabric of our communities, of having a significant impact on the loss of faith in institutions and the ability for our countries to respond to the needs of their populations. And in some cases, even affecting the norms in our countries. The challenge is significant and the ripple effect is significant and longstanding. So as a result, Re Rebecca and I want to have a conversation about just that, the relationship between the private sector and one of our biggest challenges, which is economic inclusion. Rebecca, we know that business has historically served as the economic engine for our communities, creating jobs and increasing a standard of living um, for workers and for their families. But over time, as I mentioned, people have become even more concerned as they see the lack of inclusivity, as they see the shrink or the widening gap um, between corporations and corporate leaders and the lives that they're able to leave and lead and their ability to provide for their families. In fact, there is a Credit Suisse report that I'm sure many of you have seen that shows that the richest 1% of adults own 43% of the world's wealth. So without economic inclusion, other forms of inclusion are also becoming even more challenging. So Rebecca, I wanna start out our conversation today by asking you about uh, what business leaders should be doing. Um, and what will you say to, what do you say to business leaders when they're confronted with these facts and the concern that we're hearing from workers and from others in communities? Well, thank you very much, Melody, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. I'm, I'm in London and it's, it's almost getting dark here. Um, so, so really thanks so much for, for inviting me along today. I think that inequality, you're absolutely right, Melody, has got to change, it isn't right. Um, but business can make a big contribution to, to tackling that inequality through contributing to economic growth, through job creation, the right kind of essential goods and services, Businesses that only exist for the benefit of a tiny minority destroy trust in, in institutions and in the private sector. And we've seen that so much recently. It's come through in studies like the Edelman Trust Barometer. You know, trust is at an all-time low of big institutions. And I think that's been you know, further accentuated by this increasing economic divide that we're seeing. It really it fractures societies. We know that within country, income inequality is worsening for over two thirds of the world's population. 
And with climate change as well, it's really disproportionately affecting the poorest communities around the world. It's massively holding back economic progress, just at a time when governments all around the globe are trying to get society back on course with the pandemic still raging. So I mean, 1.1 billion adults are still unbanked, of which um, over half of that is, is, is women. You know, and there's limited access to, to life-changing tech, to services, and all of that is, is, is blocking economic growth. And I think when we look back pre-COVID, already we had a fractured society broken up by, by gender grouping, by age grouping, by race grouping. And unfortunately, in many instances, I think that that has been exacerbated by, by the pandemic as well. We've seen global billionaire wealth increase by $3.9 trillion, whereas global workers combined earnings fell by $3.7 trillion. And we know that lots and lots of studies from many different countries around the world have shown it's those economically disadvantaged groups that were hardest hit by COVID. I think I got back from, from the COP taking place in Glasgow here in the UK yesterday. And thankfully there has been a bit of a shift about just talking about the, the damaging environmental consequences of climate change, which as we know are awful, to actually a greater focus on climate justice. You know, it's smallholder farmers and, and fishing communities that are being hardest hit by the impacts of climate change, extreme weather, whether it's droughts, flooding, they're impacting the lives of, of communities around the world that are often the most poorest and, and marginalized within that country and forcing them into jobs or areas of agriculture that are linked into things like deforestation because there are no other options. So I think business has a massive, massive job to do. What we've tried to do at Unilever, and I see other companies thankfully now starting to do this, is fully integrate sustainability into our value chain because as companies, businesses are only going to grow, actually truly grow, if the communities that they're serving are prospering as well. So what we've tried to do is, is take that process in four stages. So we say we need to get our own house in order. We then need to work right the way across our value chain. So for a company like Unilever, that's from the sourcing of our raw materials, our crops and commodities, working with smallholders through the manufacturing process, and then out into the communities that we're serving and often that's sold through might be small scale retailers or large retailers, but really thinking about how do we put economic inclusion and sustainability at the heart of, of, of all of those different touch points. Um, and I say that, I mean, lastly, you know, this isn't something that we can do just as Unilever or just, just as individual businesses. This inequality issue is pervasive. And what we need to do is have the right kind of approach, a bit, a bit like a sort of social equivalent uh, for net zero. So there's groups now recently set up like the Business Commission to, to tackle inequality, where you've brought together lots and lots of, of different businesses from different sectors to actually look at how do you have a proper business model that understands the importance of, of, of the economic imperative and really make sure that communities are consulted in how businesses are growing. Yeah, Re Rebecca, that's fantastic. I mean, you've talked about building this lens into the business model. So it isn't something that's marginalized or sitting on the side, but it's part of the air that a business is breathing as it's doing its work. And to that end, I want to do a deeper dive on what you all are doing at Unilever. Um, Unilever is a huge company and it is uh, an umbrella for a number of iconic brands. I mean, I, I think you, know, you all are probably making money in, in a lot of money just on me alone on Ben and Jerry. <laughs> um, but there's also Vaseline and Lipton iced tea and Dove soap. I mean, brands that are sitting in all of our kitchen cabinets. And in 2021, you announced eight social commitments that were clustered under three different pillars, um, raising living standards, creating opportunities around inclusivity and preparing people for the future of work. And I want you to tell us a little bit more about what drove you to developing that strategy and the commitment and what you learned along the way. And not just the good, the good things, but also what you would do differently if you knew then what you know now. Yeah, thanks Melody. So I, I, mean, I said just, just a couple of minutes ago, I, I think the three biggest threats that we're all facing wherever we live in the world a climate change, nature loss, and, and, and social inequality. So what we realized at Unilever is that if we want to be a business that can thrive, 
we need to actually structure the business in a different way um, to put sustainability at the heart of what we're doing and across our value chain. We believe that actually that's the best way to future-proof our business to serve the communities that we're serving around the world. And we also firmly believe it drives superior financial performance. It's a different way of doing business that is more equitable for all of those different touch points. And it's really, really important to all of our stakeholders as well. You know, when you look around the world and you see the rise of cultural movements, really, really important cultural movements, the Me Too campaign or Black Lives Matter or Time's Up, people want to see institutions changing the world in a positive way that we know when we speak to our consumers around the world, over two thirds of them want to associate with brands or with services that stand up for things that they believe in. And I think that's super, super important. And I think the further that you get down the age groupings as well, we look at the, the younger, younger generation growing up now, that's not even something that, that's up for debate. There is zero tolerance around brands that are not pursuing causes and issues that are important to the people that we're serving. And we've also seen this as well changing in the investor community. You know, ESG now is really mainstream. And I'm pleased to see in the context of this conversation, the S, the social part of that, is also gaining increasing prevalence, which is, which is absolutely right. So specifically in terms of the, the commitment that we made around fairer uh, and more socially inclusive society, so underpinning all of that work is our focus on human rights. So absolutely, that's got to be first and foremost. So we set out a whole raft of, of, of different actions. We made a commitment to, to make sure that fair living wage is paid right the way across our value chain by 2030. So we're trying to move a, build a movement towards living wage economies. And that's not just us at Unilever, that's all of our immediate suppliers as well. So as an example, we, we had a big event back in August called Part, Partner with Purpose, where we got together our top 450 suppliers. And actually, we've already got them now to commit. So 80% of them are also committing to doing that as well. And really starting to see much more galvanized actions through things like UN Global Compact or, or the Business for, for Inclusive Growth Movement. Here in the UK, where I'm based, there's the UK Living Wage Foundation, and it's setting up a global uh, a group as well to try and do the same thing. So different companies, different sectors, and bringing in civil society and, and, and trade union participation. And another big focus area that you talked about, you, you mentioned we've got three, so living standards is one. Second big area for us is equity, diversity, and inclusion. I'm really looking at how can we challenge social norms and, and perceptions so what we need to do, again, at Unilever, we always take this approach, get our own operations sorted first. So making sure we've eliminated bias, any discrimination in our own practices and policies, and making sure that we're accelerating much better diverse representations right the way across the business, all different levels of leadership. We need to look at our supply chain, that second stage. And we're spending now... 2 billion euros a year with what we're calling diverse businesses. So making sure that we're bringing in companies that are controlled by underrepresented groups. And of course that changes depending to, to according to the country that we're operating in. Sometimes it might be LGBTQI+, it might be people with a disability, it could be particular ethnic minorities in, in, in a different country. And entrepreneurship is, is a really important and powerful way to be able to empower those groups and bring them into the procurement roster of a big global company like Unilever. And then I think the third area, really important and, and probably one of the greatest, I think, responsibilities, but also opportunities that we have is through the power of our brand. And, and, and Melody, you talked about some of those brands like Ben and & Jerry's and Dove. Around the world, two and a half billion people are using our products every day. So the way that we choose to advertise and market those products can have either a mass massively positive or negative, if we got it wrong, um, impact on stereotypes in society. So really looking at how do we portray the people in our advertising that are talking about the products and, and, and services that Unilever have. So we want to make sure that we're increasing representation from diverse groups across all of our marketing. So for example, and, and, and taking that through as well to the actual products themselves, so we've just launched a, a Rexona deodorant specifically designed for people, for example, with disabilities. So really making sure that we're talking about and showing and portraying 
uh, communities in a more positive way in our advertising, but making sure that's backed up by, by product innovation as well. And then, of course, that's also the right thing to do in terms of growing our business. There's so much um, talk and so many stats around how tackling inequality is the right thing to do for business. It can really close the living wage gap, generate an additional four and a half trillion dollars every year. So business should be acting on this more. Um, but I think when you come to, to challenges, it's, it's daunting that the, the size of, of, of what we have just as Unilever have set out to do it, it is daunting. The, the paying living wage aspect is, is challenging. We're dependent on, on working across our supply chain. We need to look at different countries with different legislations, making sure that we're working with governments, with trade unions, with the right kind of stakeholders in different countries around the world to, to move and, and, and shift the needle in that way. And it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard work and, and it takes a lot of time. I think, you know, as I, I mentioned, being, being at the COP this week, really as well, looking at those interlinkages between the work that Unilever was doing on our environmental commitments around net zero, around water usage, et cetera, and the social and making sure that we put that social justice lens into the work that we're doing on our environmental commitments. So, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, for example, thinking about why are farmers in, in, in markets where we're sourcing, for example, cocoa, why, why might farmers be working in a way that isn't necessarily contributing to uh, regenerative agriculture and may even in fact be contributing to deforestation. And that's because we need to have the economic and social unlocks in place to allow people to be able to thrive. So really complicated and it requires a very joined up approach from, from business, from civil society and from government all, all working together. Well, you know, Rebecca, you were, you've touched on a number of different challenges that, as you, to use your word, are daunting. Um, and the work that Unilever is doing to try and take steps and also to engage with uh, those in your, in your business chain and other partners. One of the, the issues that I think it's critical for us to talk about is, in fact, young people. Um, the, the young people who are coming into the workforce. And I'm curious for if you will talk to us a little bit more about how you all are moving forward with your commitment to prepare, I think it's 10 million young people um, for jobs of the future and making sure that they have those skills. And tell us how you all are going about that and what those skills are, how, how you are making the changes that you see as a result of the work that you're doing every day and as you're projecting forward? You know, Melanie, Melody, I feel, um, I feel positive and excited actually when, you know, when we talk about the future and young people, the world and this fourth industrial revolution that, that, that we all talk about is just so radically reshaping the world of work. And, and COVID, as, as you and I talked about a bit at the beginning, has, has further disrupted people's jobs and, uh, and people's livelihoods. And I think you know, we're, we're both, I can tell, uh, joining this call today for, for, from working at home, you know, very different kinds <laughs> of work patterns that I think we're all getting used to, much more flexibility and, and really trying to integrate people's home and personal commitments in, in, into that work-life balance. Really, really important. I saw a study the other day from McKinsey saying, a fifth to a quarter of workforces, certainly in, in, in advanced economies, could actually work from home three to three, three to five days a week without loss of productivity. So hopefully bringing a bit more balance. And I think particularly with, with younger people, those traditional employer-employee dynamics you know, aren't, aren't fit anymore. People want to do a job that is rewarding personally and professionally, but they also need to be able to ensure that it fits into the personal restraints that they have in their lives thinking about working mothers, people with responsibilities for looking after others in the home, we need to be able to create much more flexible environments that actually recognize individual circumstances and that they actually value that, that the openness and the, and the adaptability that that brings. So when we were looking at how do we structure our own business in response to, to, to all of these changes, and, and also we think about in automation, you think about um, AI, new skills that, that people need that we don't necessarily have at the moment across the world in our global workforce. 
So we set out a commitment to equip starting um, with 10 million young people with the skills that they need for jobs by, by 2030. We know, and I, and I worry about this, you know, younger people I know in my personal life, but we see this across the world, those economic impacts of COVID are falling really heavily on young people. You know, they may well um, almost definitely have had their education disrupted over the past 18 months. Often younger people are working in sectors like retail and hospitality where perhaps there isn't that same job security. They're bearing the brunt of reduced company hiring in, in, in many different countries around the world. And there is a lot of unemployment really high among young people. And then at the same time, we hear back and, and we read in, in, in the papers and we see on the news that businesses and, and employer groups are saying that many young people are ill-equipped for the world of work today. There is, you know, in many different countries and around the world, a real emphasis on academic attainment in, in our education systems. It's all very much around making the grade. And of course, you know, we don't need to, to, to delve into the reasons or the explanations now, but you can see straight away that depending on the education and, and the opportunity that you might have had, if you've not been able to go and grow up in an environment where perhaps you've got those right academic qualifications, you're already massively unfairly at a disadvantage. And then beyond even if you have had the, the, the fortune and opportunity to get an academic ed education, actually we hear all the time now from employers that even with the right kind of academic background, it's actually about skills, it's around creativity, it's around collaboration, it's around communication, around critical thinking. So we've got on the one hand, young people not able to find relevant jobs, and we've then got employers saying they're not finding people with the right kinds of skills. And I think that mismatch of, of skills and, and demand and supply is, is, is really leading to a massive crisis in, in youth unemployment. You know, we need to build the right kind of talent pool for our future young people growing up to be to, 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 to be our workers of the future in a much more inclusive way. You know, we've seen, I think a study I read the other day in the UK, nearly a third of employers now report having difficulties filling jobs here in the UK, yet at the same time, the youth unemployment rate is, 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 is increasing. So I think we've got to think much more around access to pool training opportunities, thinking much more around how do we give young people the right kind of practical opportunities to, to, to learn new skills. So I think volunteering is really important. I was reading a study uh, in Nigeria the other day that volunteering was hugely, hugely important in helping to prepare young adults while they're at school for how to join the labour market even before they, 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 they finished a program that we've been working on in South Africa called Level Up, so Youth Employability Program, really trying to increase the work readiness of young people coming out of school. Things like Frontline Academy, a, a global platform to develop skills of young people, help them to get jobs, really trying to encourage a much more entrepreneurial approach. So recognizing it's not necessarily, well, it isn't about academic attainment, it's about using your skills, developing your own ideas, encouraging people to be more entrepreneurial. So something that we've also been looking at is how do we take our existing workforce and make sure with all these crazy macroeconomic changes going on and changes in society, talked a bit about technology and AI, that actually we can reskill or upskill all our employees to have the right kind of skill set by 2025. You know, the, the pandemic has really accelerated automation. And for employees who are working, for example, in, in, on some of our machinery, we want to make sure that they're reskilled and they've got the right kind of skills to be able to move into a different sort of job. And then I think going back to the beginning, we, we were talking about different kinds of employment models now. So we want to provide all our employees with different kinds of flexible employment options. And I think there's you know, a big, big call to action there. It's the responsibility of all of our businesses, whatever sector we're in, to ensure that our people are future ready. That's our responsibility to make sure that they have the right skills in place for how that they can succeed. Well, I, I completely agree with so many of the things that you were saying. One of the things that you said really caught my eye and made me think about some of the work that I've been doing, uh, the critical thinking skills, um, often skills that people refer to as soft skills, 
which yeah. is a term that I really dislike. Um, they're not soft skills. I think okay. of as power skills instead. And what we know, and I used to um, be on the board and I'm still involved with an organization here in the States called Year Up. And we know from our studies that employers will often hire for technical skills, but they fire for the lack of those power skills. So yeah. I, I think that that's something that's absolutely, absolutely critical. You know, and, and I also think about, again, in some other work that I've done with the Aspen Institute, I think about some of the young adults that I think you were alluding to that if they don't have those education credentials or the right education credentials that they can find themselves in dire circumstances. Um, we often refer to that cohort of young people as opportunity youth. There used to be language about around them as being um, disconnected youth or at-risk youth, which are negative ways of describing them when they see themselves as full of opportunity and, and interested in opportunity and ways that they can contribute to the workforce and to their communities. And creating those pathways for them, uh, for the 16 to 24 year olds who may not have completed secondary, may not have a post-secondary credential of any sort, are not connected to the, to the labor force. Creating and building pathways for them, we have seen to be enormously fruitful. And young people who are then able to build on those early credentials to get uh, well-paying jobs, family wage sustaining jobs. And that also not only has an impact on them, but also on the impact that the children that they may be raising, so their families and their communities. So I think that that's something else that's that's important. And then I think, and we don't often talk about it enough, this idea of preparing young adults, sometimes also older adults, but young adults um, to be citizens. And I mean that very, very broadly. And by that, I mean um, with the, the skills and the tools so that they can actively engage in their communities. Um, and I think be active members of a labor force, um, but also helping to articulate the, their desires for their communities and for their countries along the lines of what you were, have been describing across this conversation. You know, I, I think that's such a such a vital point, Melody. I really do because all of us, you know, we've all got multiple personalities. There's our there's our jobs. There's what we do at home. There's what we might do in our, our personal private lives. There might be a sports club that we're a member of. There might be a religious group that we're a member of. And I think you're so right. Is is joining up those different facets of of the different parts of your life and 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 really thinking about how how do we all want to live in a more positive way thinking about those different touch points that all of us you know different groups that that, that we're all part of i think you're so right but i find it fascinating listening to you actually around the this future of work because I, I know i know you've done so much research and and and, and work in this area about preparing young people for, for jobs of the future and i think there's such a a responsibility for us in our generation, but also a massive opportunity to, to, to take some of that and really help young people for, for the jobs of the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I would love to delve deeper into this um, and we'll, we'll save that for another time <laughs> yeah. because I do want to take a question from the audience. And the person has said, uh, has asked, do you think systems change requires a different kind of collaboration. So as we're trying to get to these large scale changes, does it require us to work together in a different way? What do you I, think? A, a, a hundred, you know, a hundred percent. I think, you know, I, I alluded to um, a model we use at Unilever that we affectionately call the onion, because uh, we say it's all about layers. So we say the, fir the first part is you get your own house in order. The second is you work on your value chain. The third is you work through the power of your brand. But then the last part is, what can you do in terms of changing the system? And I think when you start to really think about the stakeholders that are within your ecosystem, it's a much more meaningful way to try and, and, and tackle a, a, a program or a problem. You know, so, you know, something we've been doing on the environmental side for a long time, about 10, or, 10 years or so, was looking at how do we better work with our consumers who are using our home care products and portfolio to help them to reduce their carbon footprint. And we spent so much time talking and listening and trying to understand the, the, the barriers and the triggers. 
to get people to live a more um, uh, uh, reduced carbon life, try, try and, and get their own personal carbon footprints down. So if you were talking to people who were using a washing machine in a developed market, we were talking about turning down the temperature, doing a short wash cycle. And then actually, of course, what we realized is, you know, if you work on the systems change instead, and you really lobby for a renewable energy infrastructure, that's a far more effective thing for us to do across the business community, working with governments, working with, with civil society groups, because you're actually changing the whole energy infrastructure rather than just thinking about the individual and, and, and his or her own responsibility. And I think that's exactly the same on, on, on tackling some of these social issues. I talked about what we've been trying to do with things like the Living Wage Coalition. If Unilever, which we are doing, is committed to the living wage across our own network by 2030, that's great. But actually, really, if you want to change society, you need everybody to be paying living wage by 2030. So you need governments to actually raise the minimum wage to make sure that you're providing much more equitable opportunities for everybody, not just for the few that happen to be involved with a particular company. And I think when you look at, sometimes it's you know, working pre-competitively on these big issues, other times it's working with government, it's, 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 it's listening to civil society groups and understanding the context. You know, I think then that's the only way you get to, to systems change. I think the point as well that, that I was talking about um, about 10, 10, 15 minutes ago around the role of advertising as well and really looking at not just Unilever in this example, but actually across the board, we, we set up a group called the Unstereotype Alliance with UN Women that originally focused on how, was, how, how were many different companies around the world portraying gender in that advertising. And again, a shared set of commitments from a whole host of different companies and organizations around changing gender portrayal and advertising. And then now as we move forward, we're starting to think about other areas too. So for example, portraying people with disabilities in, in advertising, but I think if you don't try and work on that systems level change, inevitably, it's going to be a lot slower. You know, Rebecca, I think we just have a, literally a couple more, well, not even minutes. <laughs> um, but one question that popped up that's a reference to a comment you made earlier about flexibility. The person asked, why do you think the pandemic uh, was the way that led us into these conversations about flexibility. Uh, do you think that that's here to stay? Have we learned, have we really learned the lesson from the pandemic? If you just want to respond very briefly to that before we have to sign you off. Know, I think they always say, you know, necessity is, is, is the mother of, of invention. You know, I think around the world, we had no choice about working from home. All of a sudden, many companies, governments, organizations around the world had to quickly swap to working from home because of the pandemic. And I think that forced us into making changes very quickly and very efficiently. And actually, I view that as something quite positive because I imagine at Unilever, if we debated working from home, we'd still be talking about it 18 months later, like any other business, because of all the ramifications. And I think when you're forced into having to take action, you see actually the positives that can come. So I hope, we talked about climate change and, and taking action there, I hope the same thing happens on the social agenda too. Less talking and thinking and debating and more action straight away because we've seen as a global community that we can do that when we need to. And, you know, and I hope therefore we'll see that coming through on this debate as well. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for that. And I know there were some questions about my comments about opportunity, youth and measurement um, as, as these pathways are building, being built. I would suggest since we're out of time, the Opportunity Youth Forum website at the Aspen Institute um, that I'm affiliated with provides some really meaty information about that. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to go longer, but Rebecca, I do want to thank you so, so much. It's been wonderful to be in conversation with you um, this morning, this afternoon, <laughs> this evening, given where you are. And thank you so much for sharing the work of Unilever. I look forward oh, to- So you. nice to meet you, Melody. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. You as well. Take care. Bye.